right place because the Spirit of God is already here. We can feel Him. And why don't you just reach out and receive what you need from Him today. Hallelujah. Well, He brought me out of the mire.
Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God. Oh, do you believe it today?
he done he went to the cross and fulfilled the eternal blood covenant for almighty God before you had to take an animal a spotless animal but now because Christ the sinless spotless lamb of God went to that cross the Bible says whenever he gave up the ghost and he said it is finished God almighty took the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place and he rent it in two. That means I no longer have to have a high priest go before me one time a year and present a blood covenant and sprinkle blood upon an altar. Right now, I can go into the very throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What has he done, preacher? I'll tell you what he's done. He has sealed my eternal redemption and glory for what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Let's sing it one more time. Everything is through Calvary. The atonement, we have access. Give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. Why don't you move up from your pew, shake somebody's hand, tell them I'm so glad for what he's done. presence this morning if our ushers could come receive the morning tithe and offering I want to thank all of our visitors for being here today if you, this is your first time please fill out a visitor's card we'd love to get to know you also want to announce that this morning after the morning service we will be selling flower arrangements for donations for the prime timer trip and they're getting ready to go on a trip about a week and a half. It'll be one week from Wednesday, and we're taking all of them to Branson, Missouri. And, you know, I, I, I kind of cringe when someone says, you deserve it. You know, I'll tell you, we don't deserve anything good, but I'm going to tell you, our, our senior citizens, they deserve it. And so we, we, we want to do something special for them. We're taking them to Branson. Also tonight, our school of ministry our new school of ministry will be conducting the service. They'll be singing and preaching and worshiping. You don't want to miss this tonight, and we're excited about that. Also, uh, today is Mission Sunday, the first Sunday of every week. We designate this for Mission Sunday. We support 12 missionaries around the United States. I want to thank you so much for giving to our missions program 
And uh, we want to increase our giving around the world. We can't do everything. We can't save the world, but we can do our part. And we can, we can give, we can minister, we can labor in the field. Jesus said, the fields are white, ready for harvest, but the laborers are very few. Souls are dying every day. And I want to do everything I can to expedite the message of the cross, the message of the gospel, and see souls saved before Jesus comes back. Also, in two weeks from today is my goal. Two weeks from today on October the 15th, we plan on sharing with you the, the plans for the uh, sanctuary enlargement. And uh, hopefully the architect will be done with everything that we need him to be finished with. And I will not be putting this on Facebook Live. We'll be sharing this after the Sunday morning service. I'll give you a little bit of a hint. We're not going to be building our sanctuary over on this property. We'll probably be using this property, the front part, for parking. In the back, you never know what the Lord has for us. We're going to be extending out in the front. We'll be taking up about the first six parking spots off of the, the, the very front, off of the sidewalk or off the steps. And we'll be building a new building out here. But this, is, this building is going to go this way and that way. And we'll be going from a capacity of 525 to 800 people. So that will give us room to grow for several years. And, and that means that if we can get 800, which when, when we say 525, that is 100% capacity. Typically, churches do not grow only to 80% of capacity. That's the reason why whenever you get to a certain point, you need to start looking at expanding. And we're doing this all for the kingdom of God to see lost souls come in. We believe that God is going to continue to bring a harvest in to Harvest Time Church. And I'm excited just to be a part of what God's doing in this last day. Aren't you excited about that? Because there's no telling what the Lord is going to do in the very near future, I believe that I don't believe that we could build a sanctuary that will seat the people that will be coming to this church looking for an answer for these for the world's problems. Amen. So we just we need to be prepared. We we need to be ready to give an answer and to give that hope to a lost and a dying world. Amen. Brother Cash. I, sorry to interrupt you. Um, also on that same Sunday, October the fifteenth. October, as you know, is Pastor Appreciation Month, and Pastor Matt and Sister Tori don't want appreciation. <laughs> well, they say they don't, but um, we want to honor them. Well, I didn't mean it that way. You know what I mean. False humility. Okay. So we want to um, honor our pastors. I mean, they're my family, but I can say firsthand working with them every day. They pour their heart and soul into this ministry and to people. And... Regardless if they wanted us to or not, the Bible says to give honor where honor's due. And on that Sunday, we're going to honor our pastors. We're going to eat a potluck meal. We're asking all the church to stay after that meeting, I guess, and join us in the new gym um, for a potluck meal and just a time of fellowship. Let's give them one more hand. Amen.
you do that first verse one more time Kyle you know something Satan knows the blood of Jesus is against him but you got to claim that for yourself and you got to claim that for your own family and I want you to sing it claim it stand on it we are victors through the blood of Calvary's lamb sing it
ahead, give him praise this morning. The only thing that stands in between you and eternal damnation is the blood of Jesus. Not of the good works that I have done, not on my own holiness, my own righteousness. Only by the blood of the cross. I thank God for the precious blood. The precious blood of Jesus. I want to say congratulations to Brother Justin and Sister Rebecca Jones on beautiful baby girl. I mean, tell you, she's beautiful. Brother Butch and Sister Yvonne on their first grandchild. Catherine Elizabeth Jones, beautiful baby. At this time, we're going to dismiss all of our children from age five to whatever the age is. Twelve, five to twelve, age five to twelve. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14. In verse number 12, I want to say, I cannot tell you, Harvest Time Church, how delighted and appreciative I am as a pastor that you were so faithful during revival services. We had a revival. That's what revival is all about. What we've seen in the Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night services were just Sunday night. God moved miraculously Sunday night. What we've seen was the hand of God in our midst, and and he just helped us. And that's why we have revival. That's why we call the evangelist in. And they're so essential, and we're so thankful for evangelists. We have two resident evangelists here, Brother Steve Mullins and Brother Stephen Taylor. And uh, I want you to keep them in your prayers, their families in your prayers. I, I pray for the evangelist constantly. They need to be held up in prayer. If you have your Bibles, again, 14 and 12 of Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And then I'm going to be reading one passage out of Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 18. It says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can come unto the very sanctuary, Lord, the place that's designated for you, O God. We ask you, Lord, that you would speak to us by your word and speak by your spirit this morning. I pray that you'd anoint these lips of clay with a holy anointing that makes preaching effective. I pray that you'd anoint every ear that we could hear what the Holy Ghost would say to us. Help us, Holy Ghost. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach to you this morning on a statement that I've made multiple times. It never really went this direction, but I'm going to preach on how to make hell your home. And the subtitle is Pride. I know we've heard messages on how to make heaven your home what to do to get to heaven, and the glories of heaven when you get there. Well, this morning, I'm going to take a little bit direct, different direction and give you the step-by-step process on how to get to hell. If you want to get to hell, I'm going to show you how to get to hell. The Bible says that wide is the gate and Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I'm telling you the masses are going to hell. The very few, according to the population, are going to enter into the straight gate. The Bible
Bible is very clear on this. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14, the scripture says that hell has enlarged herself. She's enlarging herself every single day. Why is that? Because people are making the choice to go the way of Baal, to go the way of the world other than the way of God. I can tell you every person under the sound of my voice in this sanctuary, every person watching by Facebook, you will choose heaven or hell. You will choose your eternal destiny. Listen to me this morning. I must seek God and His will in every area because hell wasn't made for man but for the devil and his angels. So why is man going to hell? Man is going to hell because man has rebelled against a holy God. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus himself, the Son of God, the righteous Son of God, the one who died on the cross, the loving Savior described hell in a very vivid way. Jesus said hell is a place where the fire is never quenched. He said it's a place where the worm dies not. He calls it a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that it's outer darkness. Can you imagine? I'm going to tell you, you do not want to go to hell. Hell is a bad place, ladies and gentlemen. It's called the caverns of the damned. Today, there are millions upon millions of people that are crying out of hell. They have a memory. They have an imagination of what they were on this earth. And I can tell you, on the authority of this book, what Jesus describes about the rich man. They're wishing more than anything in this world that they could come back to this earth and make it right with God. But once you go there, it is a place of no return. I'm telling you today, you and I need to wake up. We need to evaluate where we are in the light of God's Holy Son. Don't compare yourself one to another. I must compare myself to the righteous, holy Son of God. But Because he's the only thing that's going to keep us out of hell. You say, well, preacher, what sin is so bad that it will lead us to hell? Well, I can tell you the Bible makes it clear that sin will separate you from God. But behind every sin is the sin of pride. It's called the original sin. And I can tell you, if you begin to analyze and you begin to trace back every sin in your life, everything you've struggled with, you can trace it back to the sin of pride. It's called the original sin. I'm going to say that again. At the root of every sin that any individual is struggling with, you can trace it back to its root of pride. The Puritans used to say that pride is the last thing that leads the human heart. And it is the first thing that returns. Here in our text in Isaiah chapter 14, it shows how the devil became the devil. His name is Lucifer. He's the son of the morning. We know according to Ezekiel 28 in Isaiah chapter 14 that Lucifer obviously was the music director in heaven. We read in Ezekiel 18 that he had pipes within him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I I preach against worldly music. Why, preacher? I can tell you because Satan is the choir director over worldly music, ladies and gentlemen. There's only one thing in earth that was created in heaven. I'll tell you exactly what it is. It is this thing called music. Oh, the only thing that is in earth today that was created in heaven is music. What was music created for? It was created for worship. Listen to me today. Whenever you and I allow those things to enter into our our ears and our minds, it begins to shape our souls. It begins to create desires within us. What was music for? It was to honor and to worship and to edify the Christ of a living God. To honor God Almighty. Hear me today. Lucifer, he was the, I believe, the choir director in heaven. He had pipes within him. And one day pride got a hold of Lucifer. The Bible said that he wanted to be like God. The insanity of pride, it's a terrible thing. I'm going to tell you something. It twists the mind. It brings deception. Pride is the original sin. It was created, this this, this thing about Lucifer, he wanted to be like God. And verse 12 said, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? 
And we hear it oftentimes about the five I wills of Satan. Here he says, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, uh, the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. You say, well, preacher, that's insanity. I know it's insanity. But the moment that you and I begin to talk about me, myself, and I, we are, we are allowing the same pride that was in Lucifer to manifest within ourselves. Uh, listen to me today. I, I'm going to go a lot of different areas on how to make hell your home dealing with pride. But I can tell you it all starts with me, myself, and I. Listen, whenever you and I get saved, uh, we are to be lost in him our identity is no longer me myself and I but it's Christ the hope of glory are you with me today what is Christianity all about it's about dying to self that Christ may live Paul said I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me in the life that I now live I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so what is Christianity Christianity is exchanging one life for another. My life for his. I want Christ to live within me. It's not my way or the highway. Oh, listen, whenever I get saved, he becomes the director of my life. It's no longer I, but it's him. Listen to me today. Whenever you and I want our name to be exalted, when we want to be bragged on, whenever we want to move up in the world per se, I'm going to tell you that's a dangerous place to be in. He said, I will. Listen, you can see the ambition of Lucifer. He wanted to get promoted. He wanted to move to a higher place. Isn't that what life is really all about? Getting promoted, moving on up. Listen to me. We think that Getting into a higher place spiritually is getting into a bigger position. There's nothing further from the truth. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you. What we need to do is understand in Christianity, the way up is really the way down. To get lower and lower, so low that I'm hidden underneath the very cross of Christ that no man can see me. They only see Jesus. Listen to me. We say, well, give God the glory for this. It's not because of what I've done. A lot of times we really don't mean that. What we want to really say is, look at what I've done. God, yeah, he, he has a part of this, but, but, but look at what I've done. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very dangerous place to be in. Pride is the original sin. And if pride turned an angel into a devil, what can pride do to a human being? It's the original sin. It's a devastating sin. Pride. Listen to me. Everyone in this house battles with pride. To some degree. And there are many faces of pride. You know, we, we think of the most prideful person that we know. And we think about how it manifests in their life. And we're thinking, man, I sure am glad I'm not like them. No, your pride looks a little bit different than theirs does. And we, we oftentimes, we, we exclude ourselves from the most prideful, the most arrogant, the most pompous ways. But I'm going to tell you, in the light of the humble, loving Savior, we're arrogant, we're proud, we're undone without God. Isaiah, when he got into the presence of the Almighty God, what did he say? He said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. Listen, it's only when we get into the light of his glory, allow the Holy Ghost to come down. It's then and only then are we convicted of our sins, and we see our stinking pride. Listen to me today. You'll never be more like Jesus than when you're humble and contrite in spirit, and you'll never be more like like the devil than when you're arrogant and prideful. 
Oh, hear me today. We all struggle with it, so don't exclude yourself. If you were thinking before we started this message, when I gave my title, oh, I know who needs to hear this message. God's talking to you uh, because that's a prideful position to be in. I know a lot of folks did that. Uh, Oh, come on, somebody. We all need to hear it. Why? Because we're all undone without God. Uh, Oh, every one of us need uh, God, and we need to be humbled before God. God hates pride. Did you hear me? I said, the Bible is very clear and very explicit that God hates pride. If you study the book of Proverbs, you'll find this over and over again. And if you want to find out if you're a prideful person, study the book of Proverbs. Proverbs will tell you if you're a fool. Proverbs will tell you if you're a very prideful person. And here in our text, in Proverbs 16 and 18, the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before the fall. What does this mean? That means that whenever a person is manifesting pride and they refuse to humble themselves, they're about to fall. I'm telling you, pride proceeds, goes before destruction. When you and I stick our heels in the ground, we're not accountable, we're not humble, We think of ourselves more highly than what we ought. I'm telling you, you're heading for towards a cliff and you're about to fall off that cliff. Through the years, whenever I have witnessed preachers and other Christians that have served God for a period of time, right before they fell into a great sin and maybe they completely ended their ministry, they were a very haughty person. They were prideful. They all had the same thing in common. They were unapproachable. They were unaccountable. They thought themselves to be something that they're not. Let me tell you something. Every one of us are nothing. We are dirt that have been formed into human beings and God breathed within us the living life of God, the oxygen that we're breathing today. We are nothing. The only thing that's good in me is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Anytime that I think that I have reached a a certain pinnacle, a certain point, I ought to be afraid. That ought to get a hold of me. That ought to sober me up. Why? Because God can cause the whole thing to crumble in a moment's time. Listen, the Holy Ghost moves at harvest time. Church, we ought to praise God for a good church like this. But I want to fear God. I want to stay humble because the dove could fly at any moment. Stay humble before Almighty God. Don't allow pride to get in. Listen, we're not God's special little people. There's a whole lot around the world who have not bowed a knee unto Baal. We're not the only ones. Thank God for that. Oh Lord, just allow me to be used in this last day for your glory, for your honor and help me to humble myself before the almighty God. Listen, you better humble yourself or God's going to humble you. Oh, you better humble yourself. Stay humble. And I'm not talking about a false humility. There's a difference between true humility and a false humility. We've learned in Christianity how to say the right things and to do the right things. But I want to tell you, God looks beyond what we say and what we do. He looks down at that heart to, oh God, help me not to just say things. Help me not to just, oh Lord, help me not to just pretend uh, to be a pretender about this thing. Uh, I want to humble myself and I want to please you. Uh, Hear me today. Pride goeth before destruction. I'm here this even, this morning to tell you that if God's trying to deal with you about your pride, you better deal with it right now because you're going to be heading for a fall. God is serious about this thing called pride. Pride goes right before the fall. Pride is a blinding sin that blinds us to our true condition. You know, pride is that kind of sin that we can see in everybody else. We just can't see it in ourselves. We think that we're humble. I was joking with a friend several years ago, and he said, I'm so humble, it almost seems like pride. It was we were saying this in jest, but I want to tell you that is the true mentality of so many. They think that they're humble, they think that they're contrite before God. But I want to tell you something: God looks beyond what we uh, the perception of what we're trying to portray to everybody else. As you look at the life of David. We think about David's greatest sin. As you begin to analyze the greatest king that Israel ever had, David. David was the greatest king. 
You begin to think about David in David's greatest sin. What was it? We think immediately we go to adultery. We go to his sin with Bathsheba whenever he was, he was in his room. At a time when the kings went out to battle, David didn't go to battle. He stayed in his room. And he went out on his balcony. He saw a woman bathing on top of her roof. You know the story. He took Bathsheba and he committed adultery with her and, and she got pregnant with a child. And when we think about David, it seems like that's the mark on David's life because David was a man after God's own heart. David was the one who killed the giant. David was the one that that grieved when Saul died. And and we think, man, this is a terrible sin and and this is the great mark on David's life. You know Bathsheba got pregnant and God allowed the child to be born and then the child died in time. This child died and, and God took this child because of this great sin. However, this was not David's greatest sin. One day while David was sitting in the house, the enemy came in and began to tempt David about his own great power and might. Soon David became intoxicated with pride as he tried to imagine everyone under his authority. So he calls Joab and he says, Joab, Take a census of every man that can hold a sword. Joab knew this wasn't right. It wasn't the same type of census that God told Moses to take. It was a different type of census. David, it was all motivated by pride. He wanted to know how many warriors he had. And he was puffed up with pride. Joab, this leader, this this military man, knew that this wasn't right, but he went ahead and did it. A month later, he came in and said, there's a million and a half men who can hold a sword, that can pick up a sword. The moment that he told David, uh, David was smote in his heart. He knew he was wrong. And then there came a prophet of God in, and he began to prophesy to David, this man, this prophet by the name of Gad, comes in. He tells David what's about to happen to him because of pride. Gad gives David three choices. David chooses to fall into the merciful hand of God. And do you know what the end result of this was? The merciful hand of God? 70,000 of David's men died. And that was mercy. I'll never forget the day that my eyes were open to the sin that he committed with adultery how it only took one life but the sin of pride took 70,000 lives let me tell you something ladies and gentlemen your pride that's manifested your pride that you refuse to humble yourself it doesn't just affect you it affects a lot of people it can have a domino effect oh come on somebody I'm telling you today we must humble ourselves ladies and gentlemen we must understand God hates pride he's not going to put up with it and we must receive from God almighty very quickly or he's going to humble us I want to show you a few things pride leads to. Number one, pride leads to disobedience instead of submission. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This is a message from, to Saul. You know the story, Saul was commanded not to make the sacrifice. That was something the king could not do, only a prophet. But because Saul saw that that the man of God was not coming, he went ahead and made the sacrifice. He disobeyed God. He justified his situation. Hear me today. He justified his situation, and he went ahead and did what he thought he should do. Listen to me. You and I are never, never, never justified in disobeying God according to any situation. Uh, Hear me today. God will not put up with disobedience. It all came back to pride. Uh, David said, uh, I don't really have 
have to do what the prophet said. I don't have to do what God said. Let me tell you something. This is God's word, ladies and gentlemen. If the word says it, every jot, every tittle, everything in this book, we're going to give an account for. If God says for us to do it, we better do it. I don't care if everybody else is going the wrong direction. Everybody in the church may be doing something contrary to the word of God. You and I, individually, we must get a hold of the word of God. If God says it, stand on it, obey it. If the word is God's word, we must keep his word. We cannot pick and choose which word we're going to obey. If you offend in just a small part, you're guilty of all, James says. Listen to me. Rebellion. Pride leads to disobedience instead of submission. This is one of the great sins of pride. It leads to disobedience. Listen, rebellion and disobedience to your parents. Young people, hear my heart today. If the Bible says to obey your parents in the Lord for this is good, and he says that your life and your days will be long on the earth, man, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out If you want to live a long, healthy, prosperous life, be obedient to your parents. Every time Pastor Taylor would do a funeral and and, and someone lived to be old or 80, 90, even 100 years old, every time he would always say, obviously they honored their father and mother because the Bible says if you do this, your days will be long. Uh, No, you can't rebel against your parents. Well, Brother Matt, they're not very smart. They're old fogies. They they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, Listen, they know a lot more about what than you think they know. Uh, They've been around. Uh, They may not be up with the times but I want to tell you something most things are consistent through the ages there's principles you can hold on to rebellion to a spouse rebellion to a job rebellion to the church come on somebody I'm telling you pride leads to disobedience and you say well I don't have to answer to nobody don't raise your hand but do you have that attitude I don't have to answer to nobody. I'm 21 years old. I'm 50 years old. I'm 70 years old. If that's your attitude, you have just made your first step. You have just made your first step to make your home in a place called hell. Listen to me today. Submission is not weakness. Submission is strength. Did you hear me? I said submission is not weakness. Submission is strength. Whenever we say it's not, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I must do, what God says to do. Listen, you and I must understand that it's right to submit ourselves under God's word, uh, under those who have authority over us. Hebrews 13 and 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch For your souls. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't exclude the word of God. Number two, pride leads to hypocrisy. Jesus said the Pharisees, everything they did was to be seen of men. I want you to hear this preacher today. We're so big on perception. I tell the the ministers in the school of ministry, although perception is not accurate, perception is the way it looks. In people's mind, perception is everything. So yes, we, we, we need to live above reproof. Yes, we need to be holy and separated unto God. Yes, we need to be careful what we say and do. But I'm going to tell you something. Whenever you and I are just doing things in the outward, in any area, to be seen of men, but we're really not that way, I want to tell you it's hypocrisy and it's pride. Oh, I've seen the, the religious people out there. And I want to say this before I go down this route, that I believe Christians ought to dress right, live modest, be different, go to different places. He says, uh, we need to be separated from the world. He said, come out from among them. Be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. I want to say that on the foundation right here, right now. But I'm sick and tired of seeing people that focus so much on what people see on the outside. But they don't care really what they do behind closed doors or what goes on in that mind or what they talk about. They're a hypocrite that's going to make their home in hell. Jesus said the Pharisees did everything to be seen of men. 
Look how holy I am. Look how righteous I am. They led led long prayers in the synagogue to appear holy. They dressed a certain way. Listen, a hypocrite is an actor. A hypocrite is a pretender. Pride always leads to hypocrisy. We want everyone to perceive us to be holy, righteous, good. When underneath the exterior, we are rotten to the core. Rotten to the core. We want the appearance of holiness. Listen to Matthew 23 and 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye are neither going yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Did you hear that? He's saying they make long prayers, but they're hypocrites. They're going to receive not a damnation, but it's a different level of hell, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Then he goes on to say, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass the sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools, you blind. For whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Here's what Jesus says. Ye fools and blind. For whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things therein. And whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, mercy, uh, law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye have done, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup, but inwardly you're full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like whited sepulchers, which in Indeed, appear beautiful outward, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. I'm going to say it again. I believe Christians are to look different, but don't look different and act like a devil whenever you're some other place. I still believe in holiness, and that is in conversation and the things you watch, the things you think about. Nobody knows what you think about, only you and God, because God's the only one that can read your mind. But I can tell you whatever that mind goes your actions will go we think we're holy we're not near as holy as we think we are do you want to know how to make your home in hell be a hypocrite oh listen care more about what's on the outside than what's really on the inside is this good preaching it's basic fundamental preaching ladies and gentlemen but a prideful hypocrite is the second step in making hell your home Listen, Jesus warns about it. I used to hear this type of preaching whenever uh, men would talk about the outward. And I'm thinking, man, they're coming against a conservative, modest apparel. No, no, no. It's that individual that makes it a religion, that modest apparel, because they're dirty on the inside. Uh, Listen, clean up the inside first. And I can tell you, God will clean up the outside. Uh, He'll deal with that heart. Uh, Listen, Proverbs 27 and 2 gives the third step. Pride leads to boasting instead of meekness. Proverbs 27 and 2. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. This is just good old-fashioned common horse sense. Don't toot your own horn. 
This is deep theological preaching. I'm feeling it right now. You don't have to tell everybody what you've done. You don't have to give your accolades. You don't have to lay out your spiritual resume for everybody to see. Listen, God will exalt you if you will humble yourself. You don't need to tell everybody. Let someone else praise you and be uncomfortable when they do praise you. Are you with me today? Do you want to make your home in hell? Begin to give everybody all of your accolades, everything that you've done and how holy you are, what you've built, everything that you've attained, all of your gifts. Oh, I want everybody to see how good God as oh it's all about God is it really all about God we want to to let everybody know what God has done in our lives we better be careful we need to stop bragging on ourselves, even if it is true I'm just preaching what my wife's preached to me for 24 years I'm going to give Sister Tori the credit to this message right here pride is intoxicating ladies and gentlemen Everything you have, everything you do, everything is a gift from God. And the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He can take it from you. Prideful boasting is just another step to making your home in hell. I'm going to ask the piano player to come. But while they're coming, I'm going to give you a list. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to go slow reading this list. I said it earlier that you're never more like Christ than whenever you're humble. And you're never more like the devil than when you're eating with pride. Now we're going to find out, and you be your own judge. You be your own judge this morning as I begin to read the list. This list was given to me probably, we, we got it at Harvest Time Church probably 18 or 19 years ago on a piece of paper. And I have saved it. And I want to read it to you. It's one of the most powerful truths of the proud and the broken. The contrast between the proud and the broken. Are you ready? Now, if you pass half this test, praise the Lord. If you're guilty of one thing, you need to come down to this altar. And that's probably all of us in this house. Number one, proud people focus on the failures of others. But broken people are overwhelmed with their sense of their own spiritual need. Think about that, the difference. Proud people, they, all they do is look at everybody else's mistakes and they want to talk about how unholy they are. But broken people can see by the convicting work of the Holy Ghost how ungodly I am and how, how wretched I am. Proud people have a critical fault-finding spirit They look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but theirs with a telescope. Broken people are compassionate. They can forgive much because they know how much they have been forgiven. Proud people are self-righteous. They look down on others. Broken people esteem all others better than themselves. Where do you fall in this category? Proud people have an independent, self-sufficient spirit. I don't need anybody. I can do this all by myself. Broken people have a dependent spirit. They recognize their need for others. You see the difference? I can do this all by myself, but a broken person says, I need you. I can't make it without my brothers and my sisters. We're a body neatly and jointly fit together. Proud people have to prove that they are right. And they can give you all the facts. They can lay it all out for you. They're like an attorney. But broken people, broken people are willing to yield the right to be right. I don't have to be right. I don't have to win this argument. I've oftentimes said in marriage, I can be right or I can be happy. Sometimes I'm rebellious and I choose to be right and I want to fight. And other times I'm like, you know what? This hill ain't worth dying on. You know what I'm talking about. 
Proud people claim rights. They have a demanding spirit. But broken people yield their rights. They have a meek spirit. Where do you fall into this category? Are you proud or or are you broken? Proud people are self-productive of their time, their rights, and their reputation. But broken people are self-denying. Proud people desire to be served. Broken people are motivated to serve others. Did you hear that? I don't want to sit at the highest table. I don't want people waiting on me. I would rather wait on others. I feel uncomfortable with that. Listen, I, 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 a pastor, a preacher should be honored. I believe in honoring. But I'm a man. I'm a representative of Christ. I am flawed in so many ways. I, I want to honor Him. Let's divert all the honor to the Christ man. Proud people desire to be a success. Broken people are motivated to be faithful and to make others a success. Did you hear that? Let me say that again. Proud people desire to be a success. But broken people are motivated to be faithful and to make others a success. To see others succeed is a, is a, is a very high level spiritually. To make sure that you, you're always looking out for the needs of others and, and want them to do well regardless of your own life. That's a high level of spirituality. Proud people desire self-advancement. Broken people desire to promote others. Proud people have a drive to be recognized and appreciated. Broken people have a sense of their own unworthiness. They are thrilled that God would even use them at all. Look at the difference. One wants to get the accolades. One wants to be appreciated. One wants to be recognized. Did he say my name? Did he tell about everything that I did? The other, the broken individual, cannot even believe that God would even use them in this capacity. They're just mesmerized. They're blown away. Proud people are wounded when others are promoted and they are overlooked. Broken people are eager for others to get the credit. They rejoice when others are lifted up. Proud people have a subconscious feeling. The ministry church is privileged to have me and my gifts. They think of what they can do for God. Then Let me interpret that. The proud person is basically saying, Harvest Time Church is, they should be very pleased that I'm at this church with all my gifts and my talents. But broken people's hard attitude is I don't even deserve to be a part of any ministry they know that they have nothing to offer to God except the life of Jesus flowing through their broken lives proud people feel confident in how much they know broken people are humbled by how very much they have to learn proud people are self conscious broken people are not concerned with self at all Proud people keep others at arm's length. But broken people are willing to risk getting close to others and take risk of loving intimately. They're 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 willing to take the risk of getting hurt. When you're broken, that's what you'll do. Proud people are quick to blame others. Broken people accept personal responsibility and can see where they are wrong in a situation. Proud people are unapproachable are defensive when criticized broken people receive criticism with a humble open spirit let me just stop right there and I want to say this got a few more the the proud person is unapproachable they get defensive over everything they think you're attacking them but the humble person says this whatever you want to speak into my life I want you to speak it if you see something in me I want you to tell me I want to grow in Christ. I don't want to die in this condition. I don't want to be blind to my own pride. That's a humble person. 
Listen, you need to position yourself where you're always able to receive. Don't think that everybody's trying to go after you. Don't get this preconceived idea. They're attacking my character. They're going after me. Listen to me. Every one of us need to change. Every one of us need to die to self every single day. There's things about this preacher today that has to change. Proud people are concerned with being respectable with what others think. They work to protect their own image and reputation. Broken people are concerned with being real. What matters to them is not what others think, but what God knows. They are willing to die to their own reputation. Proud people find it difficult to share their spiritual need with others. Broken people are willing to be open and transparent with others as God directs. I want to stop right there and say this. That whenever you have a spiritual need and you're just so quiet, you just you you don't want to let anybody see your weaknesses. That's pride, ladies and gentlemen. We 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 need one another. I need you to pray for me. I'm not saying hand everybody your sword so that they can kill you with it later. There's a difference. You don't give people too much information. But there are situations we need reinforcement. Proud people want to be sure that no one finds out when they have sinned. Their instinct is to cover up. Broken people, once broken, don't care who knows or who finds out. They are willing to be exposed because they have nothing to lose. There was a lady that called me several years ago. And the young man that was engaged to her daughter, she said that he came out and he confessed that he had got back into pornography and he was broken and she... And he was weeping. And this woman called me. She said, what do you think? It was a, a minister and his wife. And I said, that's a good sign. It's not a good sign that they got caught in pornography. But no one knew about this. And he's coming to the forefront and he's confessing this. That's a good sign. Because 98% of people cover it up. It's a good sign. Proud people have a hard time saying I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Broken people are quick to admit failure and to seek forgiveness when necessary. Proud people tend to deal with generalities when confessing sin. Broken people are able to acknowledge specifics when confessing their sin. Proud people are concerned about the consequences of their sin. Broken people are grieved over the cause and the root of their sin. Proud people are remorseful over their sins, sorry that they got found out or caught. But broken people are truly, genuinely repentant over their sin, evidenced in the fact that they forsook their sin. Proud people wait for the other to come and ask for forgiveness when there is a misunderstanding or conflict in a relationship. Did you hear this? No, I'm, I don't want to move too fast over this one. It's a good one. Proud people wait for others to come and ask for forgiveness when there's a misunderstanding or a conflict in a relationship. You come to me first. You make it right first. You were the one that was wrong. But broken people take the initiative to be reconciled when there is a misunderstanding or conflict in relationships. They race to the cross. They see if they can get there first. No matter how wrong the other may have been, that's a broken person. Proud people compare themselves with others and feel worthy of honor. But broken people compare themselves to the holiness of God and feel a desperate need for His mercy. Proud people are blind to their true heart condition. Broken people walk in the light. They walk in the Word. They walk in prayer. God shows them. Proud people don't think they have anything to repent of, but broken people realize they have a need of a continual heart attitude of repentance. The last one, here it is. Can we stand? Proud people don't think they need revival, but they are sure everybody else does. Broken people continually sense their need for a fresh encounter with God. And for a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Listen, as I'm reading the contrast between proud and the broken, 
I don't believe that there's one innocent person, including this preacher, that does not have issues with pride. Pride has many faces. Pride has many tentacles. It, it, it's like it moves through the individual, the soul of man, so many ways. It's powerful. It's the original sin. It's what calls Lucifer, the archangel that was the choir director in heaven, to turn into a devil. Don't allow pride to get a hold of you. Do you want to make your home in hell? I, I gave you a list. If you want me to send you the list of, of the contrast between the broken and the proud, text me. I'll send it to you. I'm telling you today, you better get a hold of it before it completely consumes you. It will twist the brain. It'll make you think that you're something that you're not. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say this again and again and again. We are nothing. We are nothing. We are nothing. The dove can fly. The gifts can leave us. We can have an accident. God can take it all away. He cares more about your eternal soul. He cares more about you getting to heaven. He cares more about those things than He does all of the nice things that you have on this earth. He cares more about the eternal than He does the temporal, ladies and gentlemen. Help us, Holy Ghost, to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. I don't want to allow pride to send me to a devil's hell. If pride can turn an angel into a devil, what can it do to a person in the church house? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I preach what you put in my spirit to preach today. Or these are your people, purchased with the shed blood of Calvary's lamb. Help us, Holy Ghost. Forgive us of our pride. Forgive us, oh God. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing that thing to manifest within us and to grow. Help us today to see the remedy. What is the remedy? It's the cross. It's dying to self. It's acknowledging. It's praying through over it. It's identifying it. Calling it what it is, oh God. We don't want to continuously live in this spirit of deception. Pride has blinded so many of our eyes and our minds to our true condition. Help us, Holy Ghost, to, to see what you see and help us to humble ourselves and hide us behind the cross of Calvary. It's all about you, Jesus. I said, it's all about you, Jesus. Help us in these altars. Can you come? Stand as close as you can to the front. We're going to pray. We're going to talk to the master, and then we're going to pray one for another. Move as close as you can to the front. We want everybody to move in. Someone asked me, will we ever take the altars out of the church? You'll have to take me out of this church in a pine box. Because the altars are a symbol of everything. It's everything. The altars. Why do we in our culture come down to the altar at the end of a service? Because when God begins to deal with you there, you make it, you solidify it right here. I'm not saying you can't solidify it in the pew. It, that's, it can happen. It does happen. What I'm saying is this is the place where we say, God, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to make it right. And that's what we need to do. There's a lot of things, a lot of areas that he pointed on us this morning. He stuck his finger on us, didn't he? A lot of areas. Help us, Holy Ghost, because pride goes right before the fall. I've seen so many fall, and I know they're heading towards judgment. Some people, some, a lot of ministers, they will not listen to anybody for various reasons, but it's always the same exact thing that's consistent through every minister. They're unaccountable. They're unapproachable. They're haughty. It's the same with individuals. You don't have to be a preacher. Pride goes right before the fall. Can we lift our hands to heaven? Heavenly Father, we come to you asking you to cleanse us and to wash us in your precious blood. Lord, the arrows of the Lord, the arrows of conviction have struck us this morning by your great mercy, by your goodness, Lord. 
You have sent your word to heal and to bring life. By your great mercy, you have sent your word to bring conviction and to help us. Oh God, I'm asking you to change me. Oh God, I'm asking you to reveal to me what's inside of this old wicked heart. Oh God, forgive me for my pride, my arrogance. Oh God, I want to be a broken man, contrite before you. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost, to be broken before the Almighty God. I want you to just begin to cry out to the Lord something that the Lord spoke to you about in this message. I want you to confess it to the Lord. Just between you and Him, I want you to confess it. I want you to repent of it. Tell the Lord, Lord, I know it's not right. Oh, God, I'm asking you right now to do a deep work. Deep calls unto deep. At the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and billows are going all over me. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me for my prideful ways, my arrogance. Oh, God. Lord, I don't even deserve to be washed in the precious blood of the Lamb of God. I don't deserve it, oh God. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy, but you gave it to me. Help me, Lord, to understand I am nothing. I am nothing outside of you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh God, a transforming work this morning. Oh God. Forgive us, Holy Ghost. Cleanse us in your blood, Jesus. Cleanse us in your blood. Oh, God. Oh, God. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Just Go ahead, cry out to the Lord. Ask Him, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. I'm nothing. I'm nothing without you. You're everything. Thank you, Lord. And watch me rise. Listen to this song. Because of who I am. Oh, yes. But because of what you Hallelujah. Not because I'm nothing. I'm Lord, I'm nothing without you. Of who you thought me into existence, Lord. You redeemed me in my sin and my wickedness. Forgive me, Lord, for my arrogance. Thinking I'm something when I am nothing. Oh, God. Hide me behind the cross. Hide me behind the cross, oh, God. Then only you would be seen. Hallelujah. I want you to move over to somebody. Unless it's a family member. Ladies praying with ladies. Men praying with men. Move over to somebody. Come on, don't don't be don't be bashful. Move over to somebody. There's something about when somebody prays for you. Oh yes, Lord. Do the work in our hearts and lives. Help us to become broken. Understanding, Lord, that we deserve eternity in hell, but you gave us eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. It's not because of
that the eyes that see my sin would still look on me with love and watch me rise. Still call out the rain and call the storm in me. It's not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading here today. still dealing with hearts. I just want you to linger. Let's just linger at these altars for a few minutes. Let's linger. Let's talk to the Lord. say something that I, I, I really think that could help you if you get a hold of this. What I'm about to say, when it comes to disputes, situations in your life, and what I just read about the contrast between the broken and the proud, being a, someone that's broken and, and taking the high road is not natural. It's not natural. What helps me? I mean, let me tell you what helps me. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But I try to take the high road as much as I can and ask for a pure heart. Let's just say, and I know a lot of people outside the church, in the church, in Tyler, everywhere, family, everywhere, just like you do. Let's just say I'm done wrong or I'm perceived that I'm done wrong. I have a fear of God how I retaliate to that person that legitimately done me wrong. I fear God. I I really do. And that helps me to walk softly and go, you know what? I'm going to be very careful in this situation. And I don't have the attitude, and I used to. I used to say, Lord, will you send fire down from heaven and destroy them? I'm just being honest. When I first got saved, I was like, Lord, they're coming against me for no reason. But I don't do that. Here's what I pray. And sometimes it's by faith. I say, Lord, will you open the heavens up over their life and bless them? And, And you see, I'm perceived, and we all have this perception that we're the one that's right and they're the one that's wrong, right? A lot of times it's misunderstandings, miscommunications. We're flawed human beings we're flawed a lot of stuff can be fixed with proper communication but here's what I do (sighs) why in the world are they doing that God help them help them Holy Ghost convict their hearts I pray that you'd open up the windows of heaven and bless them with blessings they cannot contain maybe it's me maybe they see something in me Help me, Holy Ghost. Convict my heart. Why do I do that? Why do I take that position? Because I'm afraid. I fear. I fear the Lord. The one who spoke everything into existence. The one that formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. And he put his mouth on Adam's mouth. And he breathed into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. He 
breathe. And all of a sudden, Adam starts doing this. That's what you're doing right now. That's the breath of God. You don't fear God. Get mad at your brother, your sister. Take matters into your own hand. Pass judgment. Execute judgment upon them. I got one thing to say about you. You crazy. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and God will lift you up. Fear the Lord. Pray for blessings over your enemies. Bless your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. They did it to Jesus. They did it to the prophets which were before you. They're going to do it to you. Don't take it personal. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, I thank you. Lord, humble us before the mighty hand of God. Help me, Lord, to stay humble and broken and contrite. Help me, oh God, to recognize my own filthy pride, my arrogance, when I don't want to make it right with my brother, when I don't want to say that I'm wrong, whenever I want to take the position of wanting to be edified, elevated, whatever it is, oh God, help me today. Forgive me today. I want to be humble like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Be with us as we leave this place. Drive the word deep within our hearts in the name of Jesus. As you're leaving, Hebrews 5 and 8. Though he were a son, speaking of Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus humbled himself. Most Bible theologians believe that Jesus was completely nude on the cross, beaten to a bloody pulp, unrecognizable, beaten, marred, spit upon, mocked, You saved others, save yourself. Come off that cross. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's the answer. In all of your quarrels and disputes with your brother and sister, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Whenever you can begin to pray that prayer from a heart that means it, You'll become just like Jesus. You'll be conformed every single day. Praise the name of the Lord. You're dismissed this morning. The Word of God. Meditate on it. Pray about it. Practice it. Let God have His perfect work in your life.